You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is about freedom from heroes. And what I mean by that is freedom from intellectual heroes or thought leaders or people who uh, influence the way that uh, we think. And so I guess what I'm talking about is intellectual freedom and and thinking for yourself. I wanted to do this episode because I was thinking about how much I have learned from other people. Uh, I really love ideas. I love reading. I love to read uh, great thinkers. And when I find a new idea um, that I'm really interested in, I tend to read everything that I can by that person, whether they're a philosopher or a political thinker or a scientist or, or whoever they might be. If I'm interested in a new insight or a new idea, I really like to immerse myself in uh, all of the other things that that person has written or said. And I've had um, the experience many times of having uh, intellectual heroes, people who I look up to, um, who I really feel like I've learned something from. And these could be political thinkers, like people through, even when I was a kid, who in my family were considered to be uh, great leaders or great thought leaders. And some others that I found myself from my own interests. They could be philosophers who I've read who I felt had given me a great insight into how to think and how to understand the world. And scientists who I've uh, learned of in university or read myself, who I've really understood a way to uh, interpret the world, understand the world and, and gain new insights into how it works. They could be moralists who I've learned something about how to determine right from wrong from. And even commentators or journalists, people who write about current affairs, there's been times when certain magazines or specific uh, media have given me what I felt was like a really good insight into understanding current events. And I mean, it might be interesting to go into more detail if people are interested in, in you know, my own uh, intellectual heroes and my own intellectual journey um, in another podcast. But what I would like in this podcast is to talk about, rather than the specifics of the people and the ideas, to talk about what I learned about freeing myself from those heroes and uh, to be able to think for myself. And I think also, I hope that whoever my intellectual heroes are, this can still be relevant for you because you may have completely different intellectual heroes to me, but you may find that the experience that I've had of freeing myself from them uh, is relevant to your own intellectual heroes, even if they are very, very different. So I guess when talking about intellectual freedom and thinking about it for myself, I've only ever needed to free myself intellectually from the people who I was really impressed by. Those people whose ideas don't impress me, I've never felt the need to, to in a sense, break free uh, and think for myself from them because, in a way, you know, uh, they never made a big impression on me in the first place. I'm sure that other people have had the same experience of me. Of, like, for example, in school, you were taught stuff that you just knew is nonsense. Like, I remember very clearly th sitting in in classes and thinking that this is just rubbish what I'm being told here and I did I never took those ideas seriously so those kinds of things I, I don't think you need to free yourself from it's the people who really impress you that become your intellectual heroes that you look to as leaders those are the people who I think uh, ultimately we do need to free ourselves from because although you know I, I love learning from others and really uh, involving myself very deeply in other people's ideas, other thinkers, when I, when I um, find intellectuals or thinkers who really impress me, it's very tempting when that happens to have someone else show you what to think or to have someone else think for you. And 
in a way, to look to that person to do your thinking for you. And ultimately, uh, that isn't freedom as far as I'm concerned. Uh, however good the ideas of another person are, uh, I want to own those ideas myself. I want to absorb them to such an extent that I can use them myself and not look to another person to be, to be doing the thinking for me. There's that quote, I think uh, Picasso said, bad artists copy, great artists steal. And this is the way that I think about ideas. I don't want to copy somebody else's uh, way of thinking or ideas. I want to fully steal, fully own those ideas in my own mind, evaluate them for myself, and use what I think is useful and discard what isn't so that I can take only the very best ideas that I find most useful and have the independence of thinking to use them for myself. And so I guess there's a few ways in which that has worked for me, which I wanted to share because maybe that's also something that, that uh, works for you and maybe uh, you have your own ways of getting intellectual freedom um, from, your, from your heroes. And so I'll just share with you some of the ways that have, um, have worked for me. The first technique that I've found for gaining sort of independence of thought from thinkers who I really admire is really to work out how to take only the best bits, the bits that really make sense to me, and discard the other bits of the writings or thoughts or philosophy or, or ideas of a thinker. Because one thing that, that um, everybody thinks about themselves is that everyone thinks that their thoughts are a coherent system. When someone writes a book, um, especially if it's a philosophical book or a political book or even a scientific book, they believe that their ideas all link up and interconnect and all interdepend on each other and all form a coherent body of thought or philosophy or ideas and so forth. So if you read a book, um, then you're reading what appears to be a coherent system where each idea um, depends on the assumptions or conclusions of the previous idea and it all kind of links together in one beautiful system. And that's what the writer generally believes that they're giving you, but it's uh, probably obvious even as I'm talking through it that this isn't the case, that most of the things that you will read and probably all of the things that you will read, you will find that there are inconsistencies and that there are differences between good ideas that work really well in a book that you read and ideas that just don't work, don't make sense, don't fit reality, aren't logical, whatever the case may be. And the way that I found uh, to really pick apart uh, the ideas in a book or a thinker that um, and, and get the good stuff out uh, came to me from actually reading a book about revision when I was back in university. It was a book about how to revise for exams. I don't remember what it was called, but um, it just had this technique uh, which I found really helpful, which was um, the suggestion in the book was if you're reading a book, then get some uh, three inch by five inch index cards and the stuff that you're reading, write one idea on each of these index cards so that you can, in a sense, break down a big, long, complicated text, whether this is a philosophy book or a history book, or whatever it is, you take all the individual ideas and you put one idea per index card. And then, you know, you're kind of breaking um, a whole book down into easily digestible chunks. And doing that is really helpful for revision. But what I realized with, with that technique is that then you can actually reorder the cards, the index cards, as you're looking at them. And you can start pulling ones out that don't make sense to you and changing the order of things. So you can, in a sense, recombine the ideas visually in your own, uh, for yourself, 
um, that you've got from this book. So let's say that you read a book by a political thinker or whatever, and you're really interested and you find it really convincing. What you can do is take all of the different ideas, put them on separate index cards, or if not index cards, you know, your own system of doing this, but basically write down separately what the individual ideas are, and then you can look critically at which ones make sense to you and which ones don't make sense to you and which ones you think are useful and valid and worth keeping and which ones are invalid which you can then discard and i find that really really helpful because it means that you can actually take ownership of the useful concepts or theories or ideas of this intellectual hero of yours and use them for yourself, but you don't have to take on board um, the, to use Ayn Rand's term, the package deal of all these other ideas that seem to go with that thinker. So, you know, you can actually determine which things that they said make sense and discard the things that don't make sense. And that way you get the best out of everyone that you read and you don't sort of find yourself believing or thinking ideas that just don't really make sense to you. The next sort of technique that I've found for getting intellectual freedom is really to start from the assumption that if I don't understand a text that I'm reading, then it is incoherent, it doesn't make sense. This could sound like quite a vain thing to assume, but I think actually there's a huge advantage in trusting your own understanding, trusting that if you don't understand something, there's a very good reason for that. Now, of course, this doesn't apply to fields in which you just don't have the uh, language or the technical background understanding to really interpret a text that you're reading. So, for example, if there's some kind of advanced physics book or something and you just never studied physics, you don't know and you, you, you can't read it, then obviously that's not the same thing as not understanding something because it's genuinely unintelligible to you. Uh, What I'm talking about is you're reading um, an article that makes an argument or a book that makes an argument and it just doesn't quite feel right to you. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't, you can't follow the argument. And when that happens, I just trust that that is because this writer has, at least in this text, has written something incoherent uh, that just doesn't, doesn't actually follow and that can be difficult to spot because every writer again tends to believe that what they're saying makes sense Uh, they tend to really think that they are providing a coherent theory uh, or a coherent argument or a coherent political uh, system or whatever it is especially if they're good writers they can be quite convincing but if you don't understand it I tend to go to this, go with the assumption that it's because it doesn't make sense. I think it's, um, I can't remember which scientist said this, but um, it might have been Richard Dawkins, but there is a saying that, you know, it's so bad, it's not even wrong. When something is so badly written that it's not a question of right or wrong, it just doesn't even make sense. And surprisingly, you know, even people who I really, really admire, um, who've written great things, have also written things which, to me, are just aren't arguments. They don't make sense. They're incoherent. Um, uh, they might, it might be a book that just has lots of um, ideas put together that don't really form a coherent argument. Um, and when that happens, you know, there is a temptation, I think, to think, oh, I wonder if, he, you know, I wonder if this writer meant this or maybe they meant that or I wonder if I can try and interpret how maybe I can make this all make sense to myself. I find that it's helpful, if it doesn't make sense, just to uh, trust that you, you do have the ability to determine something that makes sense and doesn't. The third thing that I've found that's really helpful in order to get intellectual freedom is to really start from the assumption that everything is a remix. There's a really good um, video series on YouTube called Everything is a Remix, um, which I think is worth watching if you haven't seen it, but I like that title. And the idea is that really all ideas are recombinations of other ideas that are floating out there in media, in in culture and so forth. And when you read something by a great writer, a great thinker, somebody you really admire, again, the writer themselves 
probably thinks that what they're writing is groundbreakingly original and new and changing the world and providing a completely new insight and so forth. And, you know, that's why they're writing the book, because they think they've got something entirely new to say. And I've found that it's really helpful to start from the presumption that what they're writing is a new combination, perhaps, of already existing ideas. And it might not even be that new a combination. It might just be a different way of saying already existing ideas. And starting like that, I think, really helps to put ideas in context, to, to think about what the context of ideas are and see anything new that you're reading in context. Because that really helps for you to see the ideas themselves rather than to sort of follow the thought leader and to depend on them uh, kind of showing you the way, if you like, of, of these new ideas. So whenever you read something, which purports to be an entirely new idea and an entirely original thing, I find it's really helpful to question that and to look at what the idea is and think about what it sounds similar to you and even to look at you know what it, how it might be similar and different to existing ideas because that actually, uh, again, is another way in which you can then get a better critical handle on what the new idea is. Because it really is quite naive and vain to assume that one's writing is really original because in many ways the most important thing about human ideas is how much they bounce around and get sort of influenced and adapted by people communicating with each other. Authors do like to think that their books are fundamentally new and path-breaking. The truth, I think, is far more that everyone's ideas are constantly being influenced and influencing uh, other people's and finding those connections can be really really helpful and you get to see also how other people have approached the same concept or written about similar things so those are some of the ideas that i have about how to gain intellectual independence how to gain independence of mind um, from the people who you admire and you look up to I think it's wonderful to admire and look up to other thinkers and you can gain so much from uh, really, really um, sort of immersing yourself in the writings and thoughts of your intellectual heroes. And I certainly do and have done all the way through my life. But ultimately, I think to be truly free, you have to move beyond that and think for yourself and have your own independence of thought. And I guess that's what this podcast is all about. And I think one of the key things that I have never appreciated myself and never um, experienced as, as a, a way of getting more freedom is when people react against their intellectual heroes. There can be another way of dealing with trying to get independence of mind is to be really cynical about other people's ideas and to scoff at the idea that, you know, there could be anything interesting or useful or even you know somehow partially new in in anything that anybody else says what i'm describing is um a method of critical thinking about your intellectual heroes but i think that allows you to actually take the best from them and not try and get other people to think for you and i don't think that reacting against the idea of uh, learning anything from anyone else um, in a kind of really cynical way is at all helpful. And I've seen that, so for example, when some people realize that they've been very, very influenced by um, a political thinker or a philosopher or somebody, then they they have this, they realize that they've come across one of the, the ideas that doesn't make sense to them or they have an emotional reaction to one of the ideas and they suddenly become kind of just as much dependent on this um, intellectual hero but rather than be an intellectual hero this person becomes an intellectual villain for them and they start to find fault with every single thing that this person has ever written and they get very involved and very invested in trying to show that uh, somebody they thought was an intellectual hero has become their intellectual villain and that kind of reaction against intellectual heroes i think is is 
not at all free either. That's sort of, you know, you're still mentally kind of dependent on these people who you have previously put on a pedestal and now you have this real hatred for. That doesn't seem to me to be any kind of way of having uh, independence of thought and, and uh, you know, getting the best out of your heroes. Uh, I think the last thing I want to say about it is that for me, ultimately, intellectual independence and freedom of thought from my heroes has been about giving up the emotional search for leaders. Um, it's so tempting, I think, to to want to have an intellectual leader, to, to want to have somebody who you can really look to, to tell you how to think. And that, I believe, comes from all of our own psychological histories as children um, and the experiences that we had looking at adults. And I think it's part of, of growing up and being an adult that you, you, know, you get to see so-called great thinkers as people um, who, who put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you and I do, and who um, are hit and miss, just like you and I are and who are inconsistent, probably, to some degree, um, and whose ideas are part of a great remix that is um, information exchange that is going on all the time um, in our current, current world. And also great thinkers who, who want to be admired. Everybody has a desire to be admired. And... You know, it's kind of easy to, in a way, either become the admiring person who, who's reading the great thinker's thoughts or to want to be that great thinker who is admired. So I, I think it's important to try and uh, grow out of that search for leaders, uh, to be truly free intellectually, um, to take the best from other people's ideas and hopefully um, contribute yourself as well and give your own ideas out. And I want to end with a quote from somebody who, who was a big hero of mine, um, but who I also found many, many faults with. Um, it's Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, and he wrote a book in the 1940s called The Open Society and Its Enemies. And there are many, many faults with this book. And I, that, that's a, a whole other story. I don't want to go into that. But there is a quote that I love in that book. Um, this was written during the Second World War. And he, he wrote... Um, our civilization will not survive unless we give up the deference to great men. And I think that's a, a really important aspect of uh, intellectual freedom, is to give up deference to our heroes, take what we can of their ideas, and own those ideas truly for ourselves so that we do truly think for ourselves. That's what free people do, is... Uh, they think for themselves. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.